This is the Horse Radio Network. What a beautiful day for horses in the morning. You are listening to the number one horse podcast in the world. Here is your entertaining look at the horse world and the people in it. Well, hi, everybody, and welcome to episode 512 of the Stable Scoop podcast on the Horse Radio Network. This is our Equestrian Roundtable show. Our sponsors this episode are Arena Saddles and you, our listeners. I'm Glenn DeGeek, founder of the Horse Radio Network and host of Horses in the Morning, the longest-running daily horse podcast in the world. I want to welcome everybody to a brand-new format of the Stable Scoop show. Stable Scoop was our first show that we did back 12 years ago. It has had a few transformations over the years. And this is the first episode of the roundtable format. I took a look around the Horse Radio Network shows, and there's about 20 of them now. And I tried to figure out what we were missing, what was missing, and we really didn't have a roundtable. And I thought, well, I like doing them, so that would be something that we could give a try. Uh, This might at times be more serious than the shows you're used to hearing me on anyway. Uh, But I promise any politics we discuss will be horse-related and nothing to do with Washington, D.C. Mostly what we'll talk about will be our lives with horses, whether you're a professional rider or you're a backyard horse owner like me. It's going to be stuff that everybody can really relate to. Uh, You know, I'll be your host and moderator, but we're going to have help along the way in the form of our panelists. If you're watching live, welcome, and you can comment. And in the comments section, uh, I see we have Chrissy Joy here. Hi, Chrissy Joy. Uh, old friend from back in Lexington days, you can comment there and we'll see the comments and you can join in the conversation that way. That's one of the reasons that this is the only show that we have on the Horse Radio Network that we're going to do live on Facebook and YouTube and uh, uh, different places. We have it going in five different places right now. We're going to do it live so you can join in the conversation of the questions that we bring up. Uh, so we really want you to do that. And then if you miss any part of this show, we will put it out as a podcast on the audio version as a podcast on the Stable Scoop feed. You can find it on any podcast player. Just look for Stable Scoop Podcast. We're going to be here every other Wednesday night at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Time. So you can we'll have a set schedule so you can join us. Our panelists, however, will rotate. We have three. Two are going to be podcast hosts or industry leaders, and one is going to be a Horse Radio Network listener or one of our terrific auditors, which are super fans. So a lot of them I see are watching already. Uh, so tonight, joining us for this roundtable, I would I like to introduce them one at a time if I can. I thought we would start with the person who helped me get the Horse Radio Network started all those years ago, my good friend, Helena B. Hi, Helena. Hi. Hi, Glenn. Hi, everybody. Helena is the host of the Stall and Stable podcast. Stable and Stall? Stall and Stable. I always get that backwards. <laughs> I get it wrong, too. I have uh, to read my show notes. <laughs> but she is the my first co-host 12 years ago. So here we are again. We just can't get away from each other. No. <laughs> I know. I know. And Whenever my phone to... dings, I'm like, it's Glenn. It's Glenn. <laughs> and old time Stable Scoop listeners who are tuning this in on their feed for the first time in a while are going, Helena's back. Yes, yeah, she is back tonight. Thank you so much for doing this. You had to be here. I mean, it's a requirement. For it's sure. so funny when you're reading the intro of Stable Scoop, but the, the old show opener was just right there in the front of my mind. Yep. And you're going to get to think about what your closer was. You're going to get to do that tonight because you did the closer every night. (laughs) I never got it right. No, she never got it right. In 500 (laughs) episodes, it was never right. Also joining us tonight, I am happy to say, is Nikki Porter. And she is here from the Take the Reins podcast. She's the host of one of our newest podcasts on the Horse Radio Network. And you're about 50 episodes into that now, aren't you? I am exactly 50. That's right. So coming out with 51 on Tuesday. Thanks for having me. Super excited. And you're representing the entire country of Canada for us tonight. <laughs> no <so>. pressure. <laughs> <laughs> you're no in Nova pressure. Scotia, right? I'm in Nova Scotia. That's right. Well, welcome to the show. Thank, Thank you for joining you. us. Helena's in Rhode Island. So we got two cold weather people here. And I wanted to do industry experts or hosts of our shows. We have 34 hosts now on the Horse Radio Network. Mm-hmm. So I figured that we could do the show for a long time and never run out of hosts to join. Uh, but also, I wanted to make sure that we got listeners involved. And we have a terrific group of listeners. They're called auditors. They actually mm-hmm. pay a little bit each month to help support the network. And they're super fans, basically super fans. We have over 550 of them now, I think. Wow. So I wanted to bring one of those on tonight. And her name is Jacqueline Burke. Hi, Jacqueline. 
Hey guys, good evening. <laughs> Thank, and you're out of D, uh, D, close to DC in Maryland. Yep. So we're about 45 minutes outside of Washington, DC. And what's the name of your farm? Uh, Hablin Hills Equestrian. And you're an adventurer. I am an event rider. Yes, sir. You're full time, right? You're a professional. Yep. Mm-hmm. Professional. Um, I competed at the FBI level and have a string of young horses I'm bringing along right now. And you do a lot of teaching, I understand. Lots of teaching, lots of teaching, training. Uh, it's a full-time gig, so it's a it's a good time. <laughs> well, good. Thank you for joining us tonight. You've been a listener to our shows for years and years. Oh, my gosh. I think it's been over like 10 years. I think I started with the WEG show back in like 2010. So, yeah. Well, you'll years. be happy to tune in to this morning's Horses in the Morning. We had Samantha on, who was my co-host for the WEG show. She oh, was wow. on the show this morning. So she'll be joining. So thank you, Jacqueline, for representing the entire <laughs> listening audience. Uh, you, pressure. <laughs> no, <laughs> I basically get to host it, do nothing. So I, I have the good job here tonight. What I had uh, the panelists do and what we're going to do in this format from now on is I have the panelists introduce the topics they want to talk about. So they each brought two to the table. We're going to get to as many as we can over the next hour. If you uh, have questions for the panelists or if you want to comment on the topic we're talking about, do it in the do it in the comment section right underneath the video here, whether you're on YouTube or Facebook. If you're on Facebook, we can't see your name unless you actually give Facebook permission to to give it to us. So right up there in the comments above this video, you're going to see that little disclaimer that says, uh, give StreamYard permission to show the name. You have to click on that for us to see your name. Otherwise, we just see Facebook user, but we still see your comments. And we have a bunch, we have Kim on here and Claire and Catherine and, and a, whole, a whole bunch of Facebook users. So welcome from all over the place, but we'd love you to join in this conversation. And I'll keep an eye on those comments and bring them up as, as they come up as well. So definitely we want to hear from you. What do you think, guys? Want to get started? Can't yeah. wait. All right. I think we should start with the listeners because they're the ones that make this all happen. So representing all the listeners for the Horse Radio Network, tens of thousands of them in 90 countries, we have Jacqueline. What was your first uh, topic? Yeah, so I thought the first thing that um, just kind of jumped out at me uh, was just talking about horsemanship and how to make horsemanship and horse care a priority. So, um, you know, I chose this topic for a few reasons. I think uh, for those who are event riders, uh, we recently got a new president elect, Max Corcoran, and uh, one of the big things she's focused on is is horse care. And so uh, we bought our farm about a year and a half ago, and for the most part, it's all adult amateurs and um for many of them, this is their first horse. Um, so they're coming into my program and they've never owned a horse before. And so um, I love my girls dearly, but it's so interesting to see like a little bit of the knowledge gap in terms of, you know, just general horse care. So, um, you know, I, I think it's a great topic of conversation and, you know, how do we instill horse care and horsemanship um, from an early age? And how do we make sure that that gap up through like an adult amateur and, and people who are buying their first horse, regardless of their age? Um, you know, how do we how do we get them those resources, especially if they don't necessarily have a program like mine with a trainer who necessarily can put in the time to teach them some of that stuff? So that was kind of what I wanted to start with. Big, heavy topic. <laughs> yeah. Well, Helena, you and I have talked about this for 12 years on Stable Scoop. You want to lead the way? Sure, sure. It is a big topic. Um, you know, I w I grew up just outside of New York City, and we didn't have or um, no no one in my family was horsey, so I didn't know about Pony Club. Had I known, then I think that would be the pe the best indoctrination to horses for anybody. So when I did finally immerse myself fully in horses, I went to the Pony Club manuals because I was already at that point aged out. So I started by reading their books, and they became my Bible. But not everybody knows to do that. And, and now, you know, there were pony club centers that the pony club, um, US, uh, USPC tried to get started and some of them are, are doing very well. But I, what I found, at least with my daughter, was that um, pony club was still inaccessible for a lot of people, especially if you don't have your own horse or if it's not nearby. So introducing a component of the horsemanship to every teaching stables program, you know, unmounted lessons, just kind of incorporate that. I think every instructor needs to start with unmounted lessons, um, especially if it's raining, if it's uh, winter, if it's too hot. There's always ways I think that instructors can 
um, incorporate horsemanship lessons, plural, because there's many of them, into their day-to-day lesson program. Um, because you, you you know, Pony Club can do all the PR campaigns that they want. We can talk about it on podcasts. We can write about it in books. But it, it might not reach the kids and the adults who are actually there in the moment at the point of contact. So if instructors like you, Jacqueline, say, hey, I need to make this part of my my program, then I think we'll reach more people at the point where it's most critical. Nikki? Absolutely. I love this topic. So my business partner and I actually just started a business called Informed Equestrian because of this conversation that we kept on having. And it was that I came from years of pony club. And so I was heavily immersed in it and I didn't know any other way. I thought that's how everyone learned about horses. And I always had access to information. And so I was, uh, Glenn, your your name is Glenn the Geek, but I was a little bit of a horse geek myself when I was, (laughs) when I was younger. And, uh, I went and I used to do like the, the international quizzes. So, We would travel just with the knowledge of like, how do you feed and what are artifacts and all of those things. But my business partner is, she kind of grew up the opposite where she didn't have access to that information. And so it wasn't as easy for her to gain those, um, those bits of information. Like, what do you do when you decide you're going to have your horse at home versus when your horse is at a boarding stable? Um, You know, what are those things that you who are, who are your go-tos when you have questions? So Jacqueline, I absolutely love the question because we see that gap and that's exactly what we feel needs to be, needs to be bridged as well as, is when we have these people who are a first time horse owner at the age of, I see a lot of women who their children are now gone off to university and they're like, they were the horse mom. And now they're going, I want to be the horse owner, not just the horse mom. And, you know, maybe their daughter or their son was, wasn't in Pony Club either. Like, where did they get that information? So I love that there's a conversation about bringing it into, um, into programs and not just relying on, uh, on Pony Club or for, for us, there's 4-H here. So I was in Pony Club. It was very popular, but pop, it's not popular where I am here. It's, uh, 4-H is popular here. So. So. So let me throw a wrench in this and see how many people I can piss off. Um, so uh, I think that actually the farm owners and lesson givers, the people teaching the lessons, are a little bit to blame for this, too, because part of what we've done over the last uh, 10, 20 years is we want to get as many lessons in as we can a day so that your rider who's brand new, and it's not only kids, we have more adult women who are in that 40 to 60 range coming into horses than almost anything else right now, uh, that they always wanted to have a pony, as Nikki said, and now they're getting one or their kids mm-hmm. had one, and now they're getting one. And part of the problem is we show up and the horse is tacked up. They have no chance to learn horsemanship because the barn is partly to blame, too, because they just want to they basically want them in and out because they got more lessons coming in. I understand it's a business. So I get that too. But how do you overcome that hurdle where I'm trying to run a business as a farm owner and giving as many lessons as I can? I don't have time to teach all of that, how to brush a horse, how to pick feed, how to look for injuries, how to do all of that horsemanship stuff, right? Uh, Because I'm not training the horse. I'm training the person uh, Mm -hmm. how to ride a horse. So I don't know. Is that the responsibility of the owner or not? I, I think actually, it's the responsibility of the instructors. Ahead. Sorry. I, we're, we're all yeah. like, yeah, you, know, go ahead and leave gonna, <laughs> you know, you're, because it's our responsibility. We're the ones who, who know better. And a lot of times our students, I'm not a teacher, I'm not an instructor, but I'm saying us, um, they don't know what they don't know. They don't even know where to look for the information. So the responsibility is, is on our, our, our shoulders to say horsemanship is a prerequisite before you get in that saddle. Um, now, how do you turn horsemanship lessons into the same kind of profit center that you do for for mounted lessons? Okay. Maybe you'll take a little bit of a hit, but if you're charging enough, then your clients or your, your students will feel the value. So if a horsemanship Mm -hmm. lesson is $50, then like, wait a minute, you know, this, this is kind of expensive, but it must be important because it's almost as expensive or just as expensive as my mounted lessons. 
Mm-hmm. So you do, you, need, yeah. you need to create some value by charging what you think it's worth. That's exactly what I was thinking as well, Helena, because it's all in the value. What, whatever you value is what you can, what you can teach to your students. So if you value, whether it be horsemanship as in learning the grooming and the, and the feeding and all of the care of a horse, as well as the groundwork and the mounted, if you can have an equal value on all of those, um, you, you said what they don't know, they don't know if they're coming to a new program, they've never done this before. How amazing would it be to enter into a program where you sit, set, you, you're set up to say like, okay, the first two weeks that you're with us, you're on the ground. And these are the things that we're going to teach you. And it's the same monetary value as when you're in tech. I think that's fabulous. And Jacqueline, don't we always have two kinds of students? You have this, the kind of student who really wants to learn everything. They want to learn how to brush and clean feet, and they want to be there when the vet comes, and they want to see the teeth float, and they want to just learn everything. And then you have the student that shows up that doesn't want any of that. They just want to learn how to ride and jump jumps. <laughs> There's really two types of students, isn't there? No, I mean, I think there definitely is. And I think it's, you know, I grew up in Pony Club as well, right? Like, totally not horsey parents. I literally got like a young rider magazine and was like, Oh, they had an article on pony club. And that's how I started. Cause there's no way I would have learned that. And I think it's, it's the, the gap is not necessarily the basic horsemanship. I, th- I think to everybody's point, right? Like at least a lot of the barns around here who have those entry level lesson programs, they do ma- seem to make, you know, how to tack your horse, cooling mm-hmm. off your horse that I think it's the, the second layer of information, right? It's wound care. It's how do you yeah. wrap a foot, you know, when there's an abscess, it's like all of those things that, you know, if you're if your traditional lesson barn, you're not going to get And to your point, Helena, like if you haven't been in pony club and gone past, you know, your D3 rating, those are the things you're not really going to see. So I think that's, to me, it's, it's not the the basic horse care, I think mm-hmm. that's getting accomplished. Um, I feel it's more that that second piece, right? Like even things like how do I identify lameness or, you know, why do we ice horses? Like what's the purpose of that? Or, you know, when to use an ivory soap versus, you know, a more performance soap on their legs. Like why is that, why does that different? So I think there's, that's the second layer that I feel like, you know, we have less kids in the barn from a working student perspective anymore, those things, you know, barn rats hanging out. Like I just see less and less of that. So how do we not lose that secondary layer? Mm. If that makes sense. But doesn't that Mm. require them to be a barn rat to actually be hanging around to see the injuries and to help with that kind of stuff? They're not going to get that when they show up for a lesson and go home an hour later. A hundred percent. But I think, you know, is that, is that still kind of, you know, something that can be happen in today's world, right? I mean, mm-hmm. from a, I don't teach a lot of kids, but, you know, from my uh, colleagues who do, right? Like their, their parents take them, they're there at the barn for an hour, even if they own their own horse. And then they're running there, you know, to another sport or another activity or have to get back for homework or, you know, it's, it's this like endless wheel. So how do you, I think it's, it's just an interesting um, dynamic, especially, you mm-hmm. know, I I think now with like safe sport, I don't know how much anybody follows that piece, but you know, um, you know, I think that makes us all even harder, doesn't it? Yeah, no, especially the barn rat thing. My parents dropped me off at a barn when I was 10 years old. Like, I don't even know if you can do (laughs) that. (laughs) Like, I'm not really sure. So Uh, it's Um, funny you brought that up because Kimberly has a comment. She said, then these kids go to high dollar shows and the parents pay for grooming, braiding, et cetera. The parents have some responsibility in this too, which is kind of what you're Mm -hmm. saying in a roundabout way is the parents also have some responsibility in this. Yeah. I think Helena, I I love the idea of, um, you know, horsemanship lessons. Like I, I think one of the things I really wanted to do was, um, as I think about my own program, right, is, you know, having whether it be like a monthly meeting with all the girls or maybe we bring a topic. But, you know, it. I'm not going to lie. It's not something that I've been able to implement yet. But one thing I did do, um, I have all the girls like fill out like a goal sheet every year. So what um, I did do for 2021 is I was like, what is like two or three things that you want to learn off the mm-hmm. horse? Right. So I think to like your point, Glenn, like it's on the instructors. Like I, I, that's something, you know, Hey, this is something I can do like immediate. And that when we go back to like, look at this in 2022, like it's my job to make sure that you learn to those things and feel confident to be able to address them. So just like a, something quick that came to mind for me. 
Nikki, I want to go back to you, but Rachel says, I agree with Glenn. As a trainer, it's really hard to add a second layer. Parents pay mm-hmm. for an hour lesson and have the kids ride, not to learn horsemanship or management or wound care. It's hard thing to help teach the kids if they are on the wheel of one activity after another. I don't know how you overcome that one. That one's a tough one, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, maybe you can replace a mounted lesson with an unmounted lesson. And uh, if you are the authority, I mean, it depends. If the parent yeah. is saying... As the trainer, as the instructor, you're the authority. You're here to teach my child or you're here to teach me, maybe a young adult. Um, Then it's hard for them. I think I think as the trainer, you have the freedom and the responsibility to say, we're going to make this a part of your program, period, end of story. Like like Jacqueline said, maybe once a month, maybe pick a topic Um, and to spin it in such a way that the student feels empowered by what Mm -hmm. they're going to learn instead of as a punishment, like, ugh, you know, I'm here for an hour and I can't ride. And you know, where you turn it, you flip it around you say, you're here for an hour and I'm going to show you how to wrap a horse Mm -hmm. so that you can do X, Y, Z, or you're going to be the best rapper there ever was. I was the worst rapper (laughs) up until six weeks ago, six weeks ago. I could not, I couldn't do polos. I couldn't do standing wraps, nothing. It took my own horse requiring surgery (laughs) and an eight week layup and having to change the routes myself before I got really good at it. Um, And I said, I really wish that there was someone there who said to me, I'm going to teach you how to rap, like until you get it right. I think, sorry to jump in here. I think, uh, I I don't know if it was on one of your podcasts, Glenn, or not, but um, somewhere I heard, and this just, Helena, to your point, um, even something simple as to your point, rapping, there was a a podcast I was listening to and, uh, the trainer made the kid or the working student come to every lesson with three braids in the horse's mane (laughs) so that like, you know, it became routine and they learned how to do it, not just at the horse show. And you were not allowed, you know, every lesson, those braids got, um, judged. So I think it's like the same idea, maybe even on the rapping side, right? Like, Hey, every time, like, I want you to walk in to the lesson, like with polos on or a standing bandage and yeah, we're going to take it off. But, you know, I think there's little things that maybe we're just not doing a great And that doesn't take up a ton of extra of your time as the instructor. Yeah. I like that idea actually. That one little thing each time. Exactly. I mean, it's just getting my head thinking a little bit about how do we keep it business wise, you know, bringing Mm -hmm. income and, and, you know, biggest bang for your buck, but also like trying to instill this, like, Hey, there's so much more than, you know, the 10% of the time that you're actually on the horse's back. Well, Jacqueline, uh, we'll end with this. We'll go on to the next topic. Uh, Catherine, who I believe is one of your barn rats says, I believe that being a barn rat experiencing all the aspects of horse care and horsemanship is an important opportunity, no matter your age. I've been unfortunate enough to be tortured by Jacqueline on a regular basis at the barn. No, she didn't say that. I added that at the end. <laughs> I do have a Catherine, so it probably is her. It's her because she said she's been fortunate enough to be able to benefit from this. So there you go. I love that. Well, thanks, Catherine. I appreciate it. <laughs> oh, no, she's not. Oh, she's not. She's Nikki's. Oh, she says, I've been Nikki. able to benefit this from Nikki and her husband, Mike. <laughs> Oh, I thought this was Jacqueline. Oh, look oh at you. funny. Good job, Nikki. I You're think torturing him up there, too. I, I am. <laughs> Jacqueline, I think you totally landed on something there, though. I think, like, that the idea of taking one little piece and saying, okay, before your lesson, and it puts it on them to be able to spend the time. They prioritize the time they need. Maybe they, they show up late and they have five minutes to wrap their horse and they come into your lesson and you're like, okay. Clearly, we have something to work on here. I think that's a great up, and then whatever time it takes in that lesson to go over that, and then they hop on. I I think you totally landed on something there. I think that's we have our takeaway for that topic. Look at you, Jacqueline brought it, yeah, and she took it away. Good job, Jacqueline. All right, let me talk about my sponsor here for this episode. We have Arena Saddles, so they're perfect in any arena. Arena Saddles are available in dressage, jumping, and all-purpose models, all classically crafted from beautiful European leather. With meticulous attention to detail, you will turn heads in any arena with confidence that your saddle is comfortable for you and your horse. Whether you are nailing a canter transition at sea, perfecting a five-stride line in the three-foot division, or galloping the countryside with wild abandon, there is a perfect arena saddle for you. Go to arenasaddles.com to learn more and to find a retailer. That's arenasaddles.com. 
And no, Helena, I did not write that commercial. Jennifer did, because that middle part, I would not have gotten right at all. And I know that's what you were thinking. So. <laughs> no, I wasn't even thinking of it. I know when Jen writes stuff. <laughs> all right, Helena, you're up next with your question of the day. So, okay. Um, it, it actually, the question that I posed is a little bit different than the one I'm going to ask right now. Um, what I was interested in talking with you guys about is the challenges of competing and showing when you are a grown up and you have grown up responsibilities like a full time job or a family. Now, the answer to that question would be very different if we asked it a year ago or a year and a half ago. Um, but now that a lot of us are home and our family dynamics and our work dynamics have changed, uh, I think the question remains, but let's use the, the current context. What, how do we find the time? How do we prepare for showing? If we're sort of your backyard pleasure owner, like me, uh, you got a horse who's way fancier than you are, but you want to try your hand at showing um, or competing or doing something that's goal oriented with your horse that's not in your backyard or in the arena. How do we start to plan for that? This is one of the most asked questions we get all the time for the last 12 years. So Nikki, you want to take it? Sure. Uh, so first of all, I have to say thanks to Catherine because I totally did not even think of that. So thank you, Catherine. <laughs> um, <laughs> but no, Helena, that's a fantastic question. And the first thing that comes to my mind is support. So making sure that you're not sitting there making those goals and setting those goals and being alone in that, but that you have somebody that you can have a conversation with where you say, these are my goals. This is how many times maybe I should ride a week. Um, what do you think? And to just have somebody that you can call and say, okay, this happened to my ride or I didn't get to ride today and they can hold you a little accountable. Um, I think that our ability to uh, work through things without that support is a little less. So I, th I think it's really, really important. Jacqueline? Yeah, so um, great question. Uh, so in addition to running my farm, I also have a full-time job in software sales. So <laughs> uh, I feel like I've become the expert in terms of like juggling. Uh, so I think there's a few things that I tell, um, you know, my students as well is, figure out in your work schedule when you're going to potentially have downtime. So I think that's going to vary for each individual, right? Um, I'm in sales, right? So I know that my really busy times are September, October, like any time like a quarter ends, right? So when I think about like my horse show schedules, I don't want to be planning a big event toward the end of a quarter for me because I just know that I'm going to be, you know, not working 40 hours a week and much more like 60. So I think it's the same thing, right? Is like figuring out where is that lull time there you might have some flexibility, hopefully, um, in terms of your job where, um, you know, you're going to have less pressure at work. Um, so you can focus more on yourself, right? Cause I think that work-life balance is really important. I think a lot of companies too, just in general, um, are really starting to focus on the work-life balance. So I think the other piece too, is just having that open conversation with your manager of like, Hey, like these are the two things I want to do in my personal life this year. You know, I may need to leave work early a couple days a week. Um, I find that if you're actually more open with your manager um, and your team in terms of like what you need, uh, they tend to be like much more open. Um, so in my experience, uh, that would kind of be like what I would start out with. Uh, I like this comment. A Facebook user said, easy, I just ignore my family. So <laughs> Or that. <laughs> or that. <laughs> That's just the easy one. So this this also comes back to, I think, too, you could add, you could throw in here, do you have your horse at home or not? And does that help mm -hmm. or not? A lot of people think when you have your horse at home, it's going to help. But then you also have all the work of taking care of your horse. And sometimes you end up doing all the work and taking care of your horse in your free time. You never end up riding your damn That's horse, right? right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, That's that right. happens, too. Everybody that boards thinks it's going to be easier when it's at home. And then the yeah. people at home go, I never have time to ride my horse because I'm fixing fence and I'm doing all the yeah. others cleaning stalls and all that. So there, there's, there's that to add into the mix. Helena, what, what are your thoughts on your own topic? Um, well, that's why I, I put it out there because I don't, I don't have any solid <laughs> thoughts. I'm trying to figure this out right now. It, there's definitely a difference between boarding and having your horses at home and how much time or motivation you have to ride. So I go out and I'll do my 
you know, do my stalls, take care of my horses. And then they come in and I'm like, all right, I need to answer emails. I have a couple of projects that I have to get done. And so my personal riding time tends to fall to the bottom of the priority list. So making a conscious effort to put my riding time at the top of my priority list is really, really important. Now for nine months out of the year, that's not necessarily a problem because the weather's nice. Uh, but in the winter time or in bad weather, I have to wait for the sun to get up into the sky at just the right angle so that the temperature is warm enough so my horse doesn't ride like a rocket ship. So there's, there's a, a balance that you have to play with um, when to ride, like Jacqueline said. Know what your work schedule is. But what I tend to do is carve out time in my calendar, in my daily calendar, and say, I, and I look at the weather ahead of time. I say, okay, it's going to be you know sunny in the 40s for the next five days. I have a lot more flexibility as to when I can ride. Um, so I don't need to be as rigid in my work schedule. So I, it just playing with these schedules, but most importantly is believing that you're, it's a priority. It should be mm -hmm. a priority for you. That comes first. Well, and well, that's, hard, that's a hard one. Your podcast talks a lot, a little bit about psychology, right? And it the does, psychology yeah. of all of this. So yeah. I'm going to throw this out. Doesn't it also depend on what kind of person you are, whether you, right. you yeah. like me, unorgan I'm the exact opposite of Helena, all right? So mm -hmm. I'm scattered, unorganized. I need help to even get through the day. Um, and then you got Helena or Jacqueline who are more organized. Who They talk about carving out time. I don't even know what that is, okay? So <laughs> because I'm scattered, and I'm probably going to be the one that doesn't do very good at getting out there because mm -hmm. I'm not organized and don't carve about anything because I'm just always doing. Yeah. That makes a difference too, right? Oh yeah. That's exactly what I was thinking as they were speaking is knowing what's your draw. So uh, I had a conversation with somebody about, you know, our, we know our horses have draws um, in different places in the arena. So what, what is going to draw you to ride? So for me personally, I love to ride and we have training horses in, so I'm in the barn. And today I rode those training horses and then I left and I didn't ride my own horse. And the reason being is right now I don't have a draw with him. I don't have something that I'm riding for. And I know that that personally is something that motivates me to do those little things. Um, actually, Stacey Westfall just did a great podcast episode on this where she talks about the big things actually being the little things that, that allows us to have those, those in, that intrinsic motivation, essentially, to be able to say, this is a priority for me right now because I see the bigger picture and I see the things that I'm riding towards. Whereas some people, they, they're motivated because they just really want to spend time with their horse. So their major, uh, the reason why they ride is to develop that relationship. It just, it really depends on, on you sitting down and saying, what's my why? Like, why do I want to ride my horse? What's and my if it means you set up and you say, I'm going to set a goal to go to this show, or I'm going to set a goal to be able to, you know, do a lead change, whatever it might be. It, it kind of, it, you're right, Glenn, it depends, I think, on the person for sure. And Rachel said, I also think identifying the smaller skills and bite-sized goals that feed into mm. the bigger goals can help mm -hmm. feel it more manageable. And that's true of anything yeah. we do, right? If we take it yeah. one step at a time instead of a leap across the canyon, you know, it's going to seem easier and more manageable. So if you if you can only ride for 10, 20, 30 minutes, don't think you have to ride for an hour every time mm -hmm. either. You can take it into smaller chunks. Jacqueline, anything before we close out this topic? Yeah, yeah. Um Going back to my sales roots, uh, there was something that uh, I learned in a sales training early on. Glenn, you've probably heard this because I know you were also a sales 15 person. years, yep. So there was something that somebody said, um, and there's a book, I believe. It's called uh, Eat the Frog. Eat right? the Frog. Eat the I frog. still eat the frog. Helena so, and I have eaten many frogs over the yeah, years. So <laughs> yeah, that's the is, is the whole, for those who don't know, it's this whole concept that like, you got to like put your worst thing you have to do the day first. Right. So basically like, you know, I, while I am quite organized, Glenn, I also like have a really long to do list and I'm not going to lie. I proca procrastinate with the things that I don't want to do. Um, but the ones that like are going to be really terrible, like I make sure that I do those first during the day. Um, but Helena, to kind of your point, right? Like I look at my 
calendar for a week to not two weeks at a time. And I say, okay, like I know I have this important call and this. So like this day is going to be really crazy. So my horses are just going to go on the lunch for 20 minutes. Um, and I know that this day is going to be nice. So they're going to gallop today, right? Like I'm planning my riding time two weeks in advance. So I know exactly what they're doing. Um, and I think Nikki, to your point, right? Like if, if you're riding for something that's priority, um, you know, I think there's a point in time where you can be selfish and your riding can be your eat the frog early. Mm -hmm. Right. So, Mm -hmm. you know, making it, putting that mentality around it, like that this is going to be the thing I focus on, um, you know, over whatever period of time that is and giving yourself the space to be able to do it. And I'll just add one of the things that has worked for me, um, in the absence of riding with a regular trainer right now, doing a lot on my own is looking at what local shows are around, what schooling shows are available, looking at the prize list and saying, okay, I, I think I might be able to do this show, or I think I might be able to ride in these classes, having a, a, a tangible, um, something tangible that I can reach for looking at it in print or looking at it online and saying, there it is, there's the show, there are the classes. It's going to happen a month from now. It, um, it inspires me, but it also gives me something concrete to reach for. You know, mm-hmm. if I can't come up with a goal on my own or even with my instructor, cause sometimes instructors are a little fuzzy, you know, um, at least in my experience. So if I'm looking for something that's really concrete, then going out and seeing what's available, that's doable for me. You know, I'm not going to go four hours away uh, to a three day event. I'm I'm going to go to a schooling show up the road and, you know, um, whatever I can do intro a at this point. So (laughs) yeah, it does. It all exactly. Just, I guess, I guess managing your expectations is what I'm talking about. Yeah. Uh, good topic, Helena. Good job. You guys yeah. are good at this roundtable thing. Good job. <laughs> nice. All right. So we're going to go to uh, the final question around one, and then we'll see if we have time for more. And Nikki, you, you brought a deep one here too. <laughs> this this has been like for you, Helena, yours was really something that has been with you for a while. And this is one that's been with me for a while as well. And it's the concept of responsible leadership. So the reason being is like, we know these horses get sent off for training. We're like, my horse goes for training, but what is required of us as people to be able to lead our horse fairly and to show up fairly for our horse? So what sort of training should people be getting when our horses are off for training or when our horse, let's say, is just at home chilling and we're like, what should we be doing? Oh, this is one that Jamie and I've had so much fun with on Horses in the Morning over the years. Uh, we, we have our own belief of that. But let's start with Jacqueline. What do you think? <laughs> oh, this is heavy. It is. <laughs> <That's laughs> Hence night. Um, <laughs> I, I'm doing dry January. I really feel like I need <laughs> to. <laughs> that makes uh, too much. She's yeah. shaking over there. She's shaking. Yeah. The mic is shaking. <laughs> so I, I think it's it's really starts with like being present, right? Mm-hmm. So when you're there, right? So you kind of the to me that struck as like a two part question, but I think mm-hmm. first and foremost, like being present when you're in the moment, right? So um, kind of bringing this all full circle. If you only have an hour with your horse for that day, um, where you're like dedicated training time or thirty minutes is like turning off the phone, turning off your notifications, right? Like whatever that is. Um, I ride with headphones um, and I actually put music on and I like disable my um, like text and stuff so that people like can't bother me during my like 25 minutes. I'm going to do dressage, right? So I think it, it starts with being present. But I think when you're you, you mentioned like sending your horse away and, um, you know, if your horse is out for training or whatever that is, um, when you have that period where maybe you're not dealing with them every day or, or routinely is, um, keeping the communication lines open with whoever that is. Right. Mm-hmm. So, um, if I have a horse in training, um, you know, I'm trying my hardest to make it a point to connect with the owner, uh, almost daily, if not every other day in terms of like, Hey, this is the horse's schedule for the week. Um, here are the things we're doing and then allowing, like building in time that they can ask questions about like what's going on. Right. Cause I think it's so, you know, if you send your horse to me for 30 days and I hand it back to you, 
that doesn't really do anybody any good, right? So like we got to make sure that, you know, I'm giving you back something that you feel like you also benefited from. So do you require them to take a lesson or two with you before you give the horse back or to come over and ride in your presence? Yeah. Yeah. So actually I have a, um, I have an off the track thoroughbred, the chestnut mare, uh, that we picked up in, uh, (laughs) December. So right after Thanksgiving, um, and the owner's been great. This is a first horse for her. Um, but she has a lot of horse experience, right? She's galloped race horses at the track, but she's never really had like her own competition horse. So, um, I would say she has come to the barn almost 80% of the rides or groundwork or whatever we're doing and come and watch, right? Just to be able to like ask those questions and um, bringing it full circle, right? To like the horsemanship conversation. Well, why do we do the same thing for three days in a row? And then maybe the horses go on a trail ride. Like, why is that important? Um, So I think there's just that aspect too, right? And even if your horse is gone to a point where you can't go see him visit them, um, you know, I think those conversations, like, that should be an expectation of the trainer you're sending them to, to be able to have that open dialogue so that you can be benefiting too from what's going on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Helena, anything? I have so much to say. About <laughs> it. I have so much. I'm, I'm going to do my best to keep, to be, to be concise. Um, I think, okay. So, what one of the things that I believe in, in terms of showing up responsibly for your horse, being there, is self observation, is having mm-hmm. um, a real clear understanding of where you're coming from, what your strengths and weaknesses are, where you are mentally and emotionally at any given moment when you're working with your horse. What space am I in right now? Um, sometimes we can't change that space. Sometimes our lives just put us in that space and then suddenly we're working with our horse and we can't change where we just came from. So if that's the case, you have to be able to identify, I'm in this strange space. What can I do with my horse when I am frustrated, tired, excited, chill, right? So there's self-observation, identifying where I am in that space and then um, matching that up with whatever horse I have that day. Because I there's seven days in a week, I'm going to have seven different horses. One thoroughbred mare with seven different horses, right? So being committing to observing oneself and one's horse, I think, is, is number one. Something that I just came to realize um, is that at, at some point, you're going to say, I'm struggling, I'm trying, I'm working really hard, and I'm still not breaking through that sound barrier. Why? What's happening? There's something that I can't control that I can't change. And that's the time when you need to reach out for help. Mm-hmm. And I had, I just had a conversation with Chelsea Kennedy. She's a trainer up in Maine. She, uh, I was introduced to her through Tick Maynard. And she has just this great um, mix of Eastern and Western philosophies that she uses. And she was the one who said to me, it is really and truly, I promise you, okay to ask for help. You don't have to do this by yourself. So observing myself, observing my horse, reaching out for help and realizing that it's okay to have help. um, Both of those things build a more confident, present human for my horse. And then the third thing I realized is that um, leadership you know, a lot of us want to love and kiss on our horses. They want, we want our horses to be sometimes the thing in our lives that we don't have. We, we kind of expect our horses to fill a gap that we're not getting elsewhere. Um, and here's where my ADHD messes me up. I completely lost my train of thought. Um, filling in the gap, our horses being there. That's it. It's gone. Poof. <laughs> My meds wore off. I got nothing. I, was My pony breathing. refuses to cook dinner for me, though. Oh. <laughs> He's just not there for right. me. I got to tell finish. you. I got it. I'll wrap okay. it up. I'll wrap it up. I promise. Um, is leadership. So in, in looking at my horse, instead of my best friend or a puppy mm-hmm. dog or a pet or even, uh, you know, an athlete, she's like my employee. I can love her. I can respect her. But I need to teach her. I need to manage her sometimes, uh, but she, there's times where she needs to work for me. So if she pins her ears and says, meh, I don't want to, 
or if she's a little backed off one day or she's just not cooperating. There's times when I have to say, listen, we need to work. Let's, let's push a little bit. But I give her the opportunity to say, I really can't today. Something hurts. I don't understand. So looking at my relationship with her as more of an employee, employer, um, has made me feel more like a leader. And, mm-hmm. and embracing that feeling, she's responded appropriately. Mm-hmm. Uh, Daniel says, Brent Graff said, horses are great therapy, but they are not our therapists. Yeah. That's a good line, actually. That's Nikki, you want to end uh, com- la- one last comment on this? And then we will, I think we'll have time for one more. Yeah. So I, I love everything about that. It's, uh, Helena, that was fantastic. And I can see that this is like one of those topics that uh, that you you're probably personally diving into with your horse as well. And the one thing that kind of made me really um really aware of of this conversation is how annoyed and frustrated i get when someone shows up and asks something of me that they're unable or unwilling to do themselves and so then i started looking at my relationship with my horse and saying okay i'm asking you to do these things i'm asking for you to be able to relax i'm asking for you to be able to let go i'm asking for you to be able to trust and focus and work hard? And am I able to do any of those things myself? So that those questions I ask myself on a daily basis with my horse, and it changes on a daily basis, whether I'm able to relax, whether I'm able to focus. I have a lot of people who say, oh my gosh, my horse just won't focus. And then I have a conversation with them and they say, I have a really difficult time focusing. And so I th- I personally believe it's our responsibility as a leader to be able to work on those things outside of work, l- show up for ourselves and say, what are, what are we, what am I lacking in? What am I weak in? What are my strengths? How can I, how can I really play to those? But how can I also outside of my work and my horse, um, strengthen my areas that I am going to ask of my horse? So that's really, uh, that's where they, what drove me was like, man, I don't like it when that person says that to me and they can't do it themselves. I'm like, oh, wait a second. <laughs> <laughs> Good topics yeah. here, guys. All right, I'm going to give you guys a chance. Let's start with Helena. Uh, you can, uh, I'm going to give you an opportunity here to do an elevator pitch. So this is the Reader's Digest version and give your podcast a plug. Stall and stable ideas for happy horse keeping. It kind of fits into that last question. Um, there are myriad ways to keep our horses happy from um, what we feed them to the friends that they hang out with, to the kind of fencing that we choose, uh, creating an environment that's comfortable for them so they can have a comfortable and fun relationship with us. Sometimes it's you know the, the place that we put them in and sometimes it's the people we put them around. Yeah, stall good and job, stable. and it's stallandstable.com, right? Yes. Very good. All right, Nikki. All right, so Take the Reins podcast is a personal growth podcast for horse owners who are looking to show up as their best selves both in and out of the barn and just really guidance to be able to do that and understanding that how we show up in one place in our lives is how we show up in every place and our horses are one of the best teachers to be able to tell us how we're showing up and areas that we can improve. And they're, they're the first ones to tell us and they're the first ones to tell us what we need to work on and the first ones to tell us when we're accomplishing something. Good. And that's, uh, where, where's the best place? Just look for Take take the Reins on any podcast player or go to NikkiPorter.ca. That's right. All right, cool. And Jacqueline, tell us a little about your business. Yeah. So um, I'm an FEI event writer uh, and our uh, business uh, here focuses on helping adult amateurs and uh, young teens come, you know, through the levels pursuing, um, you know, their own horsemanship goals and strengths. And um, I feel that I uh, can, you know, really be a part and a key person to help you guys achieve your goals. So um yeah, and as you can see, she's just jumping little jumps now. She's not in the big ones. Yet. I love your person in that picture. He's so cute. <laughs> oh, thank you. She's amazing. Oh, she. Oh, God. Look at that tush. 
<laughs> and of course, we're brought to you by Arena Saddles. You can find all our saddles at arenasaddles.com. And I host Horses in the Morning Daily Show. We've been, uh, tomorrow is 2,600 episodes. So we're at episode 2,600 tomorrow. <clears throat> and uh, we're around Horses in the Morning to search for it on any podcast player. We And that's a, more of a show where if you want to have a good laugh, a good time, and, and maybe learn something a little along the way, we don't, we, we don't really care if you learn anything. We just care if you have a good time. <laughs> so <laughs> Jamie might argue with that. I don't know. Um, all right. So let's, I'm going to, we'll try and get through as much of this one as we can. And uh, I'm going to introduce it for you. Uh, this was Jacqueline's, and it's one that I wanted to bring up today, too. It's the future of equestrian sport. Where are we at? Uh, you know, with losses of land and, you know, a billion dollar facilities right up the street from me here in Ocala, which is absolutely beautiful, by the way. Um, you know, what, where do we, where are we at in 20 years from now? You know, are we, are we looking at the, are, are we back to only the rich will have horses, you know, which is kind of one of the scenarios that could play out here, or only the rich can afford to show? Are we seeing less and less kids coming in? You know, where are we at? Where are we going to be? And, and Helena, I know this is partly what your show tackles anyway, is kind of this broader picture of, of land ownership. It's something we've been talking about for years and years and years in fox hunting, especially. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, so what, 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 where, where do you want to go with it, Jacqueline? What, what's... We could have a whole hour long. Show. Yeah, I know. I, Just, know. I feel like any of these topics we've talked about <laughs> for sure. So, um, you know, I, I think it's just interesting. Um, the, the first thing that kind of comes to mind, actually, as you say this out loud, uh, I think one big push we've seen probably over the last year, just in general, is just around diversity and inclusion. Uh, and I think as as we as a the equestrian sport, right, regardless of discipline, uh, I think it's really starting to become a, a priority and focus. I think that's going to open up doors, right? Get more people into the barn, into loving horses and just understanding the impact horses can have in your life. So I hope, Glenn, that this is not just, you know, the wealthy have horses, Um you know, I, th I think that's a big piece. I think the the second side of it, though, is, you know, with loss of land, right? Are we just going to be in these huge, you know, very purpose built facilities uh, that we're seeing, right? Or are we still going to have that backyard horse show? What's that going to look like? So I don't know. It's a it's a thing I think about a lot um, as I think about my own business and, and my own future. Um, so I just, you know, I think it would be interesting to see where the next 20 years take us for sure. I think it depends where you live too. Like we're right up the street from the World Equestrian Center here in Ocala. And we moved yeah. here eight years ago to Ocala. And right now, because of the World Equestrian Center, from the time we moved here, the prices of little farms have doubled in price in that eight years. So, and rents right now, what you would have been paying maybe $1,200 for a house and a little barn right now will cost you three to 4000 and that's wow. in a matter of eight years because of that facility going up. So I think mm -hmm. it depends where you live, too. Uh, Nikki, you know, what are your thoughts on this? Especially, you know, you're from Canada. You're seeing this happen up there, too. It's a worldwide problem. It's not just us. Well, it's interesting because I may be from Canada, but I'm from Nova Scotia. And our horse world, I want to say it's like five years behind most places. Um, but when I think of like large facilities and are there going to be the backyard shows, the, the problem I see with the backyard shows is that not enough people are supporting them. Um, so th there's a possibility of them um, kind of dying out. But unfortunately on our end, we don't have all of those big shows to be able to then alleviate and like give us somewhere to go and, and to fill the space. So um, personally, if I want to go to a big show, I have to travel quite a distance. Um, but we do have really passionate people on this side of Canada that we're looking at, you know, how do we grow? And in my eyes, in the last 10 years, our, um, our horse world has grown significantly. And I feel like it's, it's in a really positive direction. Um, we have, we have, if I wanted to all year long, I, almost every weekend, including winter, you could, you could go somewhere. So, um, there's, there's stuff going on more now than there ever, ever has been. So I, I feel really positive about our horse future here, but at the same time, we're different because 
I feel like I'm speaking like five years in the past from where you guys are speaking. If that yeah, makes sense. That's interesting. And Helena, yeah. you're up there in Rhode Island and you're kind of in a, you're kind of in a uh, no man's land of horse world, right? Where you are in Rhode Island yet New England's full of horse opportunities, right? But where you are is kind of, but then you did something about it. You started doing clinics. In I your did. Area. Yeah. I did. I did. So I went from New York to Boston to Rhode Island and, um, you know, my circle of horse people, well, north of Boston, there was lots of people. Yeah, I could tons. literally hunt out that's my back door. Yeah, yeah, that's where we met. And and I could take Zeke out and and hack through hunt country for days and, and never reach the end of our trails. Uh, here in Rhode Island, things are very different. Um, we kind of get lost between New York and Boston. And it is about where you want to be. If If I was a serious competitor and I had really big goals, I would probably pick up and move to a place where... Uh, the horse activity was strong. If if I really wanted to hunt three days a week, four days a week, I'd either go back to the North Shore or I'd move down to the Mid Atlantic. You know, someplace where and I've done this before. I've looked for real estate and I pulled up the MFHA map and said, "Well, where where's the nearest hunt?" And it's got to be drag. You know, um, so moving to where you want to go, I think it it's not out of the question, especially now that people have more flexibility um, as to where they can work. So if you can work remotely, and then why not pick up and move to Kentucky, move to Ocala? Um, I know that's not feasible for a lot of people, especially with kids and school systems, but you do need to decide on just how important your, your competitive life is. That said, there are people like me who would like to have access to quality clinicians and professionals. So why not bring them here? There are mm-hmm are a lot of really good clinicians who make a lot of money at at doing this. Yeah, they're competing, but they make a pretty penny getting on a plane, teaching for two days, and then going back home. And they like it. It's enjoyable. It gets them away from the farm for a couple of days, maybe uh, some responsibilities, grown-up responsibilities that aren't so fun. They can focus just on on teaching. So, uh, you know, there's there's, this is two-phased. One is bringing the equestrian sport to us. And the other is creating, um, sort of a community that, so my job, I'm like the ambassador, you know, like, Hey, going to the local school and saying, why don't you guys, uh, put out an email blast to your students and let them know that there is writing instruction around here mm-hmm. or talking to a local trainer and saying, you know what, you got a 10 stall barn and a really nice outdoor. Why don't you do some schooling shows? So, um, generating more interest to create equestrian activities in my small area, you know, bring the pros to me, but then I need to kind of serve as an ambassador and Mm -hmm. drum up some business in my area as well. Mm -hmm. If you don't mind, I'm going to speak to that because I think that's something that we're doing really well in Nova Scotia is we have people who have made it their mission to bring professionals in And we have one gentleman, Jim Anderson, who comes from out West and he's here for a full month clinic and it is full, I think two years ahead now. And so people are starting to be exposed to so much good horsemanship. Then what happens is those, those professionals come to your area and they teach people and there's, there's really invested uh, equestrians there who then take on that information and then can teach the next level down from them. So what's happened is that information's come to us. The information then stays, they learn, they invest, and then those who have invested then start teaching. So it's really created um, a really interesting and awesome dynamic of learning within our province. Uh, so good on you for for really bringing those clinicians in because I think it's a very important part of the growth. Yeah, That's exactly what we're trying to do with the the Stall and Stable Pro Clinic Series. Exactly. Perfect. Is raise the bar so that, uh, you know, when we're having trained the trainer sessions. So these yeah. clinicians come in and the trainers can take that because we, we got a lot of junk. I mean, we've got a lot of bad advice and bad horsemanship that's being propagated around here. Again, because no one's really paying attention. Mm-hmm. When you fly yeah. under the radar, you get away with a lot of things that you shouldn't necessarily. So bringing in that level of quality kind of exposes what's good and what's bad about horsemanship in the area. And hopefully we'll raise, raise the bar a bit. Yeah. Well, good job guys. That's it. Our hour's up. Have <laughs> Just to like that. To you. That's it. It's over. <laughs> I have 977,000 more things to say. <laughs> 
<laughs> Thank you. This has been great. You guys were great first panelists, by the way. I couldn't have Thanks. picked better here today. You guys were wonderful. Appreciate it. And we'll have you back here at some point. But we are going to rotate the panelists because we kind of want to get different voices, again, from around, around the world. Uh, but we'll definitely have you back. Really appreciate you being here. Thanks to all. Let's give an applause to everybody commenting. Everybody was commenting yeah. away today. Uh, the listeners are great. We really appreciate you guys joining us as well. So one more chance. Helena, where do you find your show? Stallandstable.com. Nikki. NikkiPorter.ca. And, of course, you can find both of their shows, Take the Reins and Stall and Stable, on the Horse Radio Network. And Jacqueline, you can find her up there. She's going to be hiding this weekend under her pillow, hoping not to get in the middle of a riot up there near D.C. Uh, I hope you're not going into town this weekend. Uh, let's hope not. I'm just not leaving my farm. You better not. <laughs> Until I come to you, Glenn. You know, okay, we're weeks. safe down here. I don't yeah. predict any rioting in Ocala this weekend, so <laughs> you, you should you should be safe. I'll be down there soon. Yeah, we'll we'll hope to see you when you come down. And and uh, Jacqueline has started now being kind of an unofficial fill in co host on Horses in the Morning. She gave it a try the other day. That's why she has an official looking mic now. Mm-hmm. And you were terrific. You were great. Oh, thank you. Yeah, we're, it was so much fun. Now, and that's the point where she called up her boss and said, I'm not selling any of this thing this morning because I'm going to do this radio show. <laughs> I just didn't tell them. <laughs> oh, yeah. Nobody's listening. It's, it's fine. You know what? You it's again, it's the that, line. that calendar. You book it far enough in advance, you know, no one can bother you. <laughs> You can find me at Horses in the Morning, just horsesinthemorning.com or Horses in the Morning on any podcast player. Five days a week, way too much me, but I'm there if you want to join in. Uh, tomorrow, we actually are hosted by Jennifer, my lovely wife, and Mary Kitzmiller. They're, they do their training episode once a month. I know that's one of Helena's favorites. Wicked. So yeah, they listen. she listens to that every month, and they'll be back here tomorrow talking horse training on tomorrow's episode. And then Friday, we do a little Really Bad Ads, which is a lot of fun as well. Uh, and and if you didn't catch this whole show, if you're watching live and you didn't catch the whole thing, just go to Stable Scoop on any podcast player, subscribe, and we will. Uh, you'll hear the whole thing. We're going to put it out in audio form. Plus, we really we haven't done crap over 12 years. We were really bad at this. We've done poorly at getting our YouTube channel going. We're doing that now. We're going to get the YouTube channel going with these videos. So subscribe on YouTube. Just search for Horse Radio Network. Subscribe over there. Part of the reason we want to get YouTube going is we're doing a little road trip at Horse Radio Network here this summer in August, providing we have vaccines in our arms by then. Uh, We're going to be taking our brand new RV, and we're going to be going on the road for a month in August. Uh, We're staying east of the Mississippi this year, and we're going to be staying at listener farms all over. Jacqueline, get your farm ready because we're staying at yours, too. (laughs) All right. We're staying at listener and auditor farms all over the East Coast, and we're going to be going and doing our shows from your farms. We're also going to be adding a video component because other listeners want to see what your farm's like and what your horses are like. So we're going to be doing a lot of videos, and that's why we're trying to get the YouTube channel up and running as well so we're going to be doing a vlog series uh for that uh, road trip next year we're probably going to do a longer trip six weeks out west of the mississippi so visiting listeners out there it's something i've always helena knows i've been talking about this for 12 years he has it, it's come close a few times so it's really nice to see finally coming to yeah, fruition well you know what i want to come with you guys so in the you're west allowed coast. to come visit us you're allowed to come along no no i want to come along i want to yeah, stay you can away. come along we have an i extra saw that bed. you got it's huge <laughs> we have an extra bed it's okay uh you know what almost dying made me realize that i really would need to start doing this stuff <laughs> so we went out and bought the rv and that was it, it we're going on the road. So Good I'm for looking you. forward to that this summer as well. So we're looking forward to meeting all of you in person. And we'll be having meetups, listener meetups along the way. That's part of the responsibility of people who are putting us up is to also do listener meetups in towns or at the farms. And it just should be fun. We can all get together and meet each other. Thanks to all of our listeners. We appreciate you being here. Helena, how did we always end Stable Scoop? What was the last line? <sighs> she screwed it up. Every time for 500 episodes, which is why I made her do it this right now. Um, and we'll be back next week with the scoop. No, you always ended it with happy scooping, everybody. Oh, damn. <laughs> Make that 501. Helena, how believe. do we end up every episode? Um, I was happy scooping. A to re- there you go. I was giving you a chance happy to redo scooping. it. Happy, happy scooping, scooping, everybody. 